Would you like to start or? Yeah, I believe everybody knows me, right? <laughs> Don't need any, at least in this room, okay? So um, thank you, uh, Minister Tang. Uh, so we start with a few questions or a few uh, topics that you would like to probably elaborate more. Uh, while the COVID-19 pandemic goes through recurring waves, there is another pandemic magnified by the social platforms called infodemic hmm? that seems to spread as fast uh, and with equal uncertain consequences. And how can the technology and associated innovation counter it? And is there a digital vaccine under development? Yes, several. Uh, so um, I, I believe that uh, we usually rely on two things, and both are in conjunction with civil society. And the first strategy is called humor over rumor, using the power of humor, which is even more viral than outrage, uh, to counter the rumors. And also uh, notice and public notice, which is a little bit like quarantine, uh, that makes sure that we contact trace uh, the whereabouts, the lineage of a piece of disinformation uh, and then make public about it when people are about to share it they can see that it's actually a information manipulation so uh, in the later uh, strategy one example would be uh, a, a couple months before our presidential election so at the around the end of 2019 uh, around the same time as the coronavirus uh, first appeared um, there there was a, a idea that said that uh, uh, people in Hong Kong the young protesters uh, were murdering the police uh, and get paid $20 million, end of quote. Uh, and then, uh, of course, that's not true, uh, but it's making the rounds in Taiwan because we partner with the voluntary fact-checking groups such as the uh, COFAX uh, project from the G0, V0 community uh, so that people can long press any uh, message on the line, uh, closed chat room, uh, to kind of report spam or scam or disinformation so we know at any given time which uh, scams or spams or disinformation are getting viral, so to speak. So at that time, we understand it has a maybe R value of three, meaning on uh, average, each person spread it to three other person, which will then uh, spread it. And then the contact tracers, sorry, the fact checkers uh, get to work uh, and then uh, to to look at the picture. And the picture that's associated with that caption was actually a Reuters photo, uh, but it only depicts a, a young protester. If you look at the original caption, it only says there are young protesters in Hong Kong, end of story, right? So somebody uh, mutated uh, the, the spike protein to overstretch the metaphor. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, uh, then the contact tracers uh, fact check that and trace it back uh, to the Weibo account of the Zhongyang Zhenfa Wei Chang'an Jian, the Chang'an Sword, or the Central Political and Law Unit of the uh, People's Republic of China regime uh, Weibo account. And so uh, they discovered that that's when this original mutation happened. Uh, and it's then registered uh, into the International Fact Checking Network uh, so that on Facebook and other social media, when anyone wants to share this story, uh, because we don't take anything down, we don't do takedowns, uh, but there's a kind of mandatory label uh, that says uh, this message. Uh, this caption that you just shared is uh, proudly sponsored by the uh, Chinese Communist Party or something like that, as discovered by the contact tracing work of the TFCC. And so uh, I believe this small anecdote shows that uh, just as we counter the pandemic with no lockdown, uh, we counter the infodemic with no takedown, because takedown, um, when done incorrectly, I, I think it amplifies the polarization and the state. Uh, for the state, there is no correct takedown, right? So we should en en enable the people's immunity uh, by exposing people to kind of the mRNA strands package in a fact checking. Uh, I think I've already overstretched the metaphor, sorry. <laughs> but I think that's the basic idea. Thank you. The, um, the second uh, topic is that the COVID, I, and I know this is particularly dear to you, uh, the COVID-19 has had a profound impact on the Gen Z, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is setting the stage for the young, the youth, to interact with the healthcare system, among, among other systems. Are there digital technologies helping them in this aspect on a global scale uh, and in Taiwan? Uh, what after the app 1922? Uh, is there a plan for a digital vaccination passport? Mm -hmm. uh, if yes, how will it look like and how would it be authenticated and recognized globally? 
Well, it will look exactly like the European Union DCC, which you probably are already familiar with, right? So uh, we, we uh, looked around and chose the standard that is open and that is friendly uh, for non-EU members to also adopt. Uh, and so the EU DCC implementation is already done. Um, the, the only thing that's preventing us from rolling it out generally uh, is, as you mentioned, this kind of uh, mutual polylateral agreements uh, to certify each other's digital signatures. I believe that's still in the works, but uh, Commander Chen Shizhong of CECC have said publicly that it will roll out uh, by the end of the year, uh, which is only four weeks away or something. <laughs> so so we'll, we'll see. Uh, and we design it so that it doesn't require any single app, and that's part of the digital inclusion uh, that you kind of alluded to, right? So if uh, someone doesn't have a smartphone, they can use uh, a tablet or a desktop on their public library or anything really. Uh, to, to register on that website and just screenshot or print uh, that QR code. And it's as good as a what we call yellow card, the vaccination card. Uh, because currently to do international traveling, you have to actually go to a uh, clinic or a hospital dedicated uh, to print such international uh, vaccine card, which is not very um, inclusion uh, friendly uh, for people who are uh, in the more rural areas and so on. But we're, we've designed so that any uh, laptop with a printer can and print an internationally recognized uh, card with a EU DCC compatible QR code on it. Um, and the API is open so that, uh, for example, when we roll out the contact tracing uh, SMS-based QR code, um, we get two million uh, vendors printing their own QR codes. A lot of it was with the help of Famiport and uh, the iBond from uh, Family Mart and 7-Eleven, respectively. Right? So you can actually use their kiosk enter your phone number and some contact details, and then using their printer to print out any uh, number of those uh, QR codes uh, prettily laid out for other people to, to scan, and many people did do that. So we're, we're opening up the API so any uh, major convenience store chains, or really anyone who want to be a distribution center uh, for the uh, yellow card vaccination card can sign up to do so. Um, people are increasingly living out their lives in the digital space, which governments cannot fully control. What are the government's options to contain the power of the big tech companies, including their power of censorship, while preserving the constitutional rights and at the same time pursuing the national priorities? Yeah, well, that's a seminar topic, right? We, we can't spend uh, three entire days on this topic. Um, and, and I've got, what, 30 minutes. But anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I think that the main challenge to democratic polities especially during the pandemic, when we have to do things like contact tracing, uh, is that it, it seemed like an impossible trade-off, right? You either aggregate all the data to the state, which creates its own problems, or you aggregate data to the large private companies, which creates even more problems. Uh, and, and there seems to be no, no uh, kind of winning path uh, from this. Uh, but in Taiwan, the 1922 SMS I just alluded to uh, was neither a state aggregation solution. It's not GovTech, but it's also not a private sector attack. It's literally created by the very civil society who care about privacy themselves. The GovZero community with uh, around 10,000 active participants designing all those different solutions, looking at all those different international solutions for contact tracing, finally settled down what we call uh, multi-party computation, meaning that the state must not uh, aggregate your check-in SMS. So when you scan the QR code and send it to 1922, it doesn't go to the state is just stored temporarily uh, on your telecom uh, carrier. And the carrier just rotates it out. It's like post-it note that gets uh, removed and shred <coughs> after 28 days. <coughs> exactly like the paper-based uh, shredding, except, of course, it's done automatically by the telecom operators. Now, the telecom operators doesn't know uh, which venue these 15 digits correspond to. As I mentioned, only the venue owner uh, and the trade van um, company, which uh, maintain this database, know the mapping type of a trade van, doesn't know your checking records. So it's like puzzle pieces, right? Out of those six or seven different puzzle pieces, you have to piece everything together in order to reverse engineer uh, the whereabouts of any given person. But all of them have signed uh, contractual obligation that only 
the uh, mandated contact tracers can actually look at those different pieces of data together, and they must uh, leave a reverse auditable record. So on the website, sms.192.gov.tw, if you type in your uh, phone number and uh, receive an SMS and authenticate yourself, you actually get a full downloadable print of uh, all the 28 days uh, window of contact tracers uh, looking at your messages. So it's like a reverse accountability. Exactly like if you use a national health card, you can on the NHI Express app uh, look at which clinics and pharmacists have access to your uh, health data in the past. Uh, and so that's basically ensure mutual accountability. And even for uh, wiretapping uh, agencies and like the investigative unit and so on, who uh, initially filed a search warrant, one of them filed a search warrant, which was denied by a judge uh, that wanted to use the SMS records. We very quickly issue an interpretation saying uh, the SMS, each of those SMS message carried this words that uh, this is reserved for pandemic control use only, and therefore it's deleted after 28 days, unlike the wiretap uh, SMS, which is deleted after six months, and this is sent not to anyone really, whereas the SMS regular is sent to someone you know, and so therefore these are different things, and uh, if the telecoms do not hand over data to the wiretappers, that's entirely legal. So we issued that interpretation not because we're, we're nice, although we are nice, uh, but because the original inventors uh, was not government technologists. The initial inventors from the civil society are ready to say that the government has abused their initial design unless we make such interpretations. So having social sector owned public spaces in the digital realm, I think is the way out from this uh, kind of false dilemma between uh, aggregation between the big tech and the big state. Thank you, thank you, and very uh, brilliant explanation. As we progress towards hybrid models of living, we will see more things than obviously remotely. Working from home is a fact. Shopping online has grown tremendously recently. Uh, education online is uh, implemented as a new way of learning. Also, the political systems uh, are moving towards more par participated processes uh, with generic or specific digital platforms that give the possibility to form and organize large crowds. Mm -hmm. In some countries, like in Italy, I am personally doing it, we already see some early experiments of direct participation through digital votes. Mm -hmm. now, I know that the digital democracy is a big topic for you. I see some of uh, your things on, on YouTube, and I know that you are going to join to join a, a workshop in the US. Mm -hmm. Uh, the summit, summit for in, democracy. Uh, yes. For democracy, uh, what are uh, the implications, uh, the limits of the digital democracy, and what are the implications of cyber security on it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the limits um, basically are bandwidth and latency. That's like <laughs> networking 101, right? Uh, but but to, to extend that metaphor, we can talk about the bandwidth and latency of democratic institutions. For example, representative democracy with legislators being voted in every four years. Uh, the latency is four years. Uh, and the bandwidth is very small, like each person only about three bits of information when it's one choice out of eight parties, for example, three bits of information every four years. And that used to be a high bandwidth uh, decision-making method when all we had was stone tools or paper. Uh, but nowadays with digital, we can improve the bandwidth so that it's not just about uh, voting in the legislators, but whenever the legislator want to uh, think about something that's emergent, that uh, the legislator themselves and their team do not have first-hand experience of, they can what we call crowdsource, that is to say, ask non-specific people on the internet net about what they feel. Now, of course, uh, back in 2014, when we <laughs> occupied the parliament and did some of those uh, early research, um, many career public service were afraid of this kind of digital consultation, and with good reason, because they think that it will only lead to polarization, hatred, uh, or um, you know, uh, the kind of discrimination, uh, vengefulness that you see online. And then uh, my main message was that that was because they were uh, using or misusing Facebook and other um, 
the digital equivalent of no town halls but nightclubs uh, to do their deliberations. So the same sort of citizens, you need to design the digital equivalent of town halls, of public parks, of university campuses, so that people can act in a pro-social manner. But if we don't design such spaces and use only, say, Facebook, then it will be like us trying to hold a town hall, uh, like this conversation, but in a uh, smoke-filled, very loud, private bouncer, addictive drinks, nightclub. Now, I have nothing against nightclubs. I mean, the entertainment sector is, has reopened in Taiwan. <laughs> it's not a place that would designate a town hall meeting or deliberative democracy in. So uh, in 2016, when I became digital minister, that's the year when we classified uh, the like civil IoT and the joint platform or whatever, all these as digital infrastructure. And that's the first time that we call it 基础建设. Previously, infrastructure budget was only allocated to concrete things, like literally things made out of concrete. Concrete. But from that point onwards, uh, things made out of bits uh, that enable the same sort of conversations that people can have on the concrete uh, spaces, town halls and campuses and so on, uh, are eligible for the public budget investment. So to answer your question uh, more, more directly, I believe it's all about the willingness to invest in the digital commons. When people invest in the digital commons, then the limits uh, can be surpassed and innovated upon by the civic tech uh, sector. But if we uh, misuse the entertainment sector uh, or infotainment sector or whatever Facebook now builds itself to, uh, then uh, we're basically trying to repurpose it outside of its original purpose and it leaves essentially no room for third party independent invention. Thank you. And um, uh, Taiwan has rec received praise um, for, uh, from a recent EU delegation visit uh, on uh, its efforts to the to fight disinformation, as you were mentioning earlier, and was even suggested to become a regional hub uh, in uh, this fight uh, against disinformation. Please tell us about the government's efforts so far against this disinformation and what improvements could be made in the future. Mm -hmm. And obviously I am referring not only to the <laughs> disinformation coming from outside, but also the <laughs> to the one generated locally, which is also a lot, okay? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, so, so not just about the Hong Kong protesters, okay, <laughs> right. Um, I, I think uh, what, what we're, uh, our mes main message to the, to the delegates, the, the MEPs, uh, was that most of the work, and preferably all of the work, are done by the social sector by the independent journalists, uh, by the schools and institutions for education. Uh, during our presidential debate, there is a lot of misinformation, probably not from uh, outside of Taiwan, but internally. Uh, but uh, the school children, like middle school children, many of them participated in the public TV and some other uh, new media organized a collaborative fact checking of the presidential forum and debate. So that many people typed in whatever the presidential candidate, the three of them, said during their public speeches and fact check it against the, the data sources and so on. But it's not just a classroom exercise. Uh, if they actually discover something that is out of the, the, the norm, that is actually counterfactual, uh, their contribution become immediately visible on live streams, on public TV and things like that. So this kind of uh, me media competence classes is what since 2019 we've replaced the old classes of media media literacy, because media literacy was uh, in an age when it's radio and television, right? Uh, people mostly consume, and you can think, I guess, critically, uh, but this critical thinking doesn't remix and transmit well, because not everyone owns a broadcasting channel. But nowadays, literally, everyone owns a broadcasting channel at no marginal cost, right? Just at a fixed rate uh, per month. And so because of that, the kids are now learning to remix the media, to be part of the media. And I believe this is the, the true solution, the, the true vaccine of the mind, uh, so that when they fact check all three presidential candidates, they become really immune to the biased or polarized or populist uh, arguments from, from any side because they've considered uh, all the sides and taken their own view and also most importantly share it uh, with the entire society. So to double down on education, both basic education and lifelong education, I believe that's the long-term solution to the infodemic. Okay, the um, uh, EU has uh, 
proposed the introduction of uh, digital identity, you were touching this topic uh, earlier, uh, which will allow citizens, residents and uh, businesses in the EU to prove their identity and share documents in their wallet uh, with a click. Mm -hmm. uh, upon providing, for example, the requester's uh, age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, that's my experience, uh, this is done verbally. Every time we have to do something, we have to speak with an operator, telling our address, our telephone number, our date of birth. And, uh, so is, is there a plan to, to move towards a similar project as in the EU? Yes, in, in Taiwan, as you <coughs> said, uh, your conversations with the private sector operators currently do not have a, a widely uh, agreed upon uh, digital certificate, although there is the citizen's digital certificate uh, and the one for foreigners too, uh, but the uh, rollout has been slow uh, and not many people even know that our CRMP engine, our CDC, actually has a NFC chip so that you can actually use your smart smartphone and uh, contact uh, it and, and use it. But not many people know that, and so not many people have a habit of using it, which of course makes the rollout even slower and so on. Uh, but for public service, uh, we do use the National Health Insurance Card, uh, where the NHIA uh, allows a kind of whitelist uh, of government entities to register the use of NHI uh, card with the NHIA, and the NHIA will provide uh, the authentication but not the medical records and not writing into the medical records area in NHI, so purely as an authenticating uh, device. And the NHI Express app, uh, which serves the same function uh, by issuing the one-time PIN codes and also a, a virtual QR code that you can show it to your camera, to your clinician over the video conference, and that counts as a swipe of an NHI. Uh, that has grown exponentially uh, during the two years of pandemic. Before the pandemic, the Ansha Express app has maybe 10% or so. So similar to the CDC, uh, the, the Citizen Digital Certificate, not the Center for Disease Control, the, the digital certificate. Uh, but nowadays, I think it's uh, over one third. I think it's approaching half of the population uh, having downloaded the NHI Express app. People use it uh, to register for vaccines, for the uh, quintuple stimulus vouchers, and, and things like that. And so I believe for public service, uh, we've not really solved uh, the, the, the issue altogether, but at least uh, close to half of the population now are getting into this norm of mutual accountability, leaving a record of all the you know national health insurance card uses and so on, and also use it to uh, last year to dedicate the mask quota right internationally. So that's many people's first. Um, entry into what we call data altruism and also uh, to to receive a kind of NFT from the NHIA certifying that you have donated your mask quota internationally. Around 7 million uh, pieces of mask has been dedicated this way. So NHI Express app <coughs> is our main way of interfacing with the population during the pandemic and we're uh, expanding the use uh, on more public services during the pandemic before because it has a norm that is trusted upon by the citizens. Now, the general purpose, private sector, reusable. Uh, electronic IT. Uh, many people felt that uh, first, it's we should not rush to roll it out during the pandemic because, uh, as in worldwide, during the pandemic, people trust the things that exist before the pandemic, and during the pandemic, people do not want uh, to have to redo the assessment of cybersecurity and privacy when it's uh, used on a kind of case with urgency that essentially everyone has to use. It's essentially uh, essential service, right? So uh, the EID was postponed so that uh, the legislature can consider more fully the implications of private sector using something like the norm of the national health care, uh, but without the national health care sensitive data, of course, purely as an authenticator. And then once they uh, pass the EID law, uh, we expect that it will also take care of the digital inclusion, that is to say to mandate that the public service must be provided even for people who prefer that their EID 
ID doesn't have an E in it, so just new ID, right? <laughs> with a disabled chip or without a chip altogether, but they must still uh, receive uh, the, exactly the same essential service. Uh, on the regulation level, the Ministry of Interior already kind of promised that, uh, but many people felt just like the National Health uh, Act and the Passport Act, uh, they need a law level guarantee that says the same thing. So that's what we're working on right now. Thank you. And uh, uh, Eri, do you have any uh, questions to? Well, perhaps a belated reminder to everyone here that uh, the minister speaks very quick <laughs> and contains a lot of substance. I've already so slowed down. So you should feel free to raise any uh, subjects because in 30 seconds of my shift to another subject. That's right. So, uh, you know, if anyone has any questions, please, please do raise it. Um, I thank, thank you, Minister. Um, I'm, if I can summarize what you were saying about uh, fact checkers, you are saying that the world out there, people in their own media, um, are using their power to fact check government and hold government to account, right? Is that, that's pretty much what you said. <clears throat> I'm interested in the same happening in the private sector, particularly the financial services sector. It seems to me that banks and insurance companies uh, are not up being up front with us. They don't tell us what they're doing, why they're doing it, why they need it, what they're going to do with it, and so on. Um, and therefore, we are stuck in a very stagnant system of banking and finance and so on in, in Taiwan. I think if, <clears throat> if fact checkers could have the same power of access to private sector companies, then maybe things would change and maybe they would be more dynamic and more digital friendly and so on. At the moment, they're just kind of covering up why they're doing it because everybody does the same. What do you think? Um, would, would, do you agree with me firstly? And secondly, what do you think people could do? Well, a, a financial service uh, with democratic participation, transparency, and accountability, that's the main ask. It's called credit union, right? Uh, I mean, t Taiwan does have credit unions, you know? <laughs> so, right. <laughs> right, right, which is, uh, and, and I think that the, the main challenge really, uh, as the term platform cooperativism, I believe that's the uh, more European take on this, uh, is essentially taking the same route, the historical roots of a co-op, of a fully participatory and accountable democratic institution, uh, but then building it uh, with, with code, essentially, because in, in Taiwan, it is true that many credit unions and co-ops for that matter uh, have difficulty retaining the younger talents uh, that are more equipped uh, with uh, you know cryptography and other necessary um, skills that, uh, that can recreate the kind of social contract on the face-to-face uh, -face setting but on a um, electronic or digital age uh, so a, a lot of our work uh, in the social innovation lab presidential hackathon and so on is just to get those two groups of social sectors the younger civic tech sector and the older community builders uh, regional revitalization us, uh, community college people, uh, co-ops, credit union people, and so on, to know each other and then uh, build uh, interesting uh, work together. And I, I think that provides a viable alternative. Uh, a similar <coughs> dynamic happened back in 2015 uh, when I first uh, kind of interned as a reverse mentor uh, in, in the Minister Jacqueline Tsai's office, uh, physically the same office as I'm holding now. Uh, and then uh, we talk about Uber. And, and a, a lot of the most innovative idea came from the, the Mozilla Foundation, a social enterprise, and also the local temple and churches, uh, which want to also work with the fleets uh, locally uh, in a way similar to Uber, but they lack the, the kind of technology know-how to build such solutions. So when these two groups of people work together and we legalize the multi-purpose taxis and so on, as long as you don't undercut existing taxi meters, uh, you're, you're free to, to work with the local fleet and so on, uh, then it enabled the local temples and churches in a way that's similar to credit unions or co-ops uh, and they also benefit. And of course with a strong social sector support, of course Uber finally uh, kind of uh, relented uh, and registered as Q-Taxi local and play by the same rules those temples and churches do. Hello. Hi, uh, Minister Audrey. Okay, so uh, I believe now it's the time for Taiwan to gain exposure, to gain connectivity with the world. Okay, ever than before. But uh, in the post-pandemic, situations, people are hard to travel and hard to connect. And I believe with your expertise, we can think about 
crazy things that we can connect with the world. So I would like to take your view, your perspective on what other strategies, perhaps a metaverse Taiwan that we can issue in digital residency or even citizenship mm -hmm. to foreigners who does not need to be here, but with necessary requirement that they too can participate in the development of Taiwan in the current time. Thank you. I think it's called a gold card. I mean, we, we've got that. <laughs> so so the, the main thing about gold card, especially during the two years of pandemic, is that anyone, I think the science and technology gold card especially, says that if you consider yourself uh, have the potential to contribute to science or technology in Taiwan, then you're eligible for a gold card. <laughs> so basically, it, it's uh, anyone really working in related fields uh, can, if they identify uh, with what Taiwan is about, uh, then they can get the gold card even without ever having traveled to Taiwan. They can obtain it overseas. And when they do so, uh, then it's uh, a four-in-one card. And one of the four is the residence certificate. Uh, so it uh, makes the travel actually easy. At no point do we bar gold card uh, holders to travel to Taiwan during the two years of pandemic. So something like that, I think, already exists. And there is a vibrant gold card community that uh, literally look at the National Development Council's gold card website and said that it doesn't work. So, so it, they, they forked the, that website into their own gold card website and then got merged back right, as the official gold card website. So if you look at the gold card website now, it's very good, but it's uh, built by the gold card holders. So basically, they, they, they pulled egg of zero, right, forking the government uh, on the National Development Council, and we need more spirits like that. And many contributors may not be physically in Taiwan when they did this contribution. And they also contribute, of course, to the bilingual nation plan uh, and many other other plans as well. That's right, exactly, yes. Yep. Uh, maybe on the topic, EU recently announced a global gateway, uh, yes. which is in line with the green directive as well as the digitalization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And maybe a couple of things back on the point that Giuseppe was asking about this information. Mm -hmm. The EU parliament was very kind in saying that there's much to be learned from Taiwan. It called, called as a gold mine. Yes, yes. Think, but, yeah. Can you briefly summarize what you think Taiwan can offer in this mm -hmm. space? Yeah, um, so one of the, the things that we can offer is that uh, this social sector-led way of innovating. So it's not that other countries don't have uh, civic technologists, right? We have G0V.IT, the Italian of zero, right? Uh, and, and many others. But uh, essentially, the latency is too long in many other democracies for a civic tech person to solve a local problem to that idea becoming a national-wide policy. It's like four years, at least, uh, in latency. But in Taiwan, it, it, be, it happens regularly, right? The mask availability map is like three days, SMS contact tracing, three days. The vaccination, uh, one-stop shop for vaccination uh, appointment, essentially just four weeks or, or something like that. Uh, and then the presidential hackathon every year ensures that the uh, top five teams of the social innovators received the presidential promise that it will become policy with all the personnel, regulation, and budgetary uh, support that it needs in the next fiscal year. So essentially, made in Taiwan doesn't mean any particular product or service, but rather a um, design, a configuration of society uh, that people can then take this process and this model and then remix with their local ingredients. So what we're offering is essentially open recipe uh, to increase the bandwidth of democracy through what I call people-public-private partnership. Multifaceted as well as open society. Yeah, exactly. Just like the, the bubble tea, right? open recipe, and, uh, open ingredients. So you opened the discussion by saying humor over rumor. Mm -hmm. So we, we noticed that on digital democracy, you actually made boba tea. Exactly, literally bubble tea. <laughs> Maybe you can share that with our audience mm -hmm. a little bit. The, the bubble tea? Uh, it's, <laughs> I, I, I've not brought it with me. <laughs> but if you check out my, my Twitter account uh, or Facebook or Instagram account, uh, you, you see the making of bubble tea uh, and uh, from the source materials. While I explained that bubble tea in Taiwan, which started uh, mid 80s and got really popular in the 90s, uh, never was patented. Uh, and so it, it's really open. So uh, the, the, the bubble 
vegetable part could be black or white, tapioca ball, the milk part could be soy milk or whatever milk, uh, the tea part could be black tea, green tea, or, or rooibos, red tea, uh, and things like that. And it's still, it's it's boba, right? It's still a bubble tea. And so uh, I explained the idea of open innovation using the newly minted uh, bubble tea emoji. I think it's just one year old, right? So we, we didn't used to uh, have this emoji, but now many people are saying that it should be our national emblem or something. But anyway, so we just spread those emojis around saying it represents open innovation and the spirit of digital democracy because it brings joy. And it's really quite humorous. So, so right, ch check out the uh, film, which is, I think, probably sponsored by the Czech uh, business chamber in Taiwan. So, so again, multifaceted and back to openness. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Any other questions? Um, hi, uh, thank you very much for the uh, very interesting examples you gave also on like um, public discourse and technical infrastructure that enables that also like to um, increase bandwidth and reduce latency. Um, I have a question, I've also seen and heard another talk of you in a podcast where you introduced like the, I think it's called polis system for structuring discourse and then also how to select or vote using quadratic voting and these processes. And I'd be curious um, to hear your take on how that might actually, that infrastructure that has been created might actually also be used not just in the um, public realm, but also maybe inside organizations. Because that very much strikes me. It, so organizations are basically still look like North Korea from the design, mm -hmm. um, the way it's designed. And on, on the outside here in the public space, it's very democratic and transparent. And I'd be curious to hear your take on how could that be utilized inside organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, one of the, the easiest sell uh, has been Slido. Now, I, I use Slido for most of my talk, uh, but for this particular one, because we're now in a setting where we are legally uh, maskless, so, so we don't have to use Slido. Uh, but otherwise, when, when we're in a, a place where nonverbal communication is difficult to meet, or if it's hybrid and half of the participants are online to give everyone a kind of equal way to chime in. And it's hard to, to read the room and know what topic people are interested in and how many uh, minutes should I spend on that particular topic. But now I can uh, see very easily by, by you nodding. So I have not used Slido right now. <coughs> but Slido, and for people who, who didn't uh, see it before, is a very simple idea that uh, everyone's phone can scan a QR code presented uh, on a screen. And then people can leave anonymous questions and comments and vote on each other's questions and comments. And just like Polis, it has no reply button by default. So it means that people can't really troll each other. Uh, but rather, if you see a question that you think is, is bogus, well, the, the only way, the only recourse is to raise an even better question and convince people sitting near you to vote for it, right? to, to lobby, essentially. Uh, and so just like Polis, Slido is real time. It gives a, a very engaged sense of conversation. And uh, in the many panels that I shared with private sector leaders and so on, uh, I, I think uh, um, I think the, the chairperson, uh, the CEO uh, Jing Qi of a major telecom, uh, because she was public about it, I can quote her on it, <laughs> said that it, it, the main thing that uh, she learned from me is that she can hold the company town halls uh, using the Slido system. Uh, so using video conference or a large town hall, regardless, uh, the, she can actually surface the, the few questions that resonates uh, within her company, and so uh, and commit pre-commit herself to answer always uh, to the issues, even difficult questions uh, that has the highest number of votes. So it gives back a sense of democratic control, right? If you can control uh, in kind of crowd-sourced way of the agenda of the conversation, of course, then it builds trust mutually because. Uh, a leader pre-committing to answer a difficult question that has the highest votes basically trusts the citizens, trusts the constituents, and the same for from the company leader to her employees. Yes. Hello, Audrey. It's so nice to meet you here. My name is Diana. And I was very surprised that we do not use Slido today. 
I know, because we're in a mosque class environment. Yes, <laughs> but you know, I was chatting in one of the guests here. Mm -hmm. He told me he's very shy. I said, mm -hmm. no worries. Other way, you know, allow us to use Slido, so you don't have to stand up and ask you a question. Oh, too bad. Now, yeah. now, now they have to tell you the question, <laughs> so you can ask for them. <laughs> I, I'm just uh, very curious because of the pandemic. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, serious patients, like uh, cancer, and then, you know, some... I know we, we have some uh, regulation, uh, so doctors cannot uh, uh, visit, uh, uh, you know, there's some problem uh, for the treatment for, for the pa patients, and they dare not to go to the hospitals. So I'm just wondering whether the government is thinking about how to... Uh, to, to, to review the current uh, regulation uh, and uh, to uh, enhance and to consider telemedicine uh, to help our patients in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our new uh, revise of the telemedicine regulation, fortunately, uh, passed right before the pandemic hits. Uh, so especially for people in the 14-day quarantine, uh, they benefit tremendously from the kind of kind of virtual national health card program. Uh, I think when uh, we encounter our real first wave, and the only wave so far, uh, this May, uh, the timely rollout of the NHI app, uh, Express app, backed telemedicine and teleconsultation, uh, really Really helped a lot of people suddenly found themselves in quarantine. Uh, and uh, I believe our current uh, telemedicine uh, regulations and laws um, is, is not so much about the laws and regulations themselves, but rather about the adoption of the clinics. The, it's just like the teleeducation. We, we have actually the teleeducation laws and regulations, but it's not until this May that many educational institutions actually try it out for the first time, because yeah. last year they did not have have any uh, excuse, I guess, to digitally transform. And right. also, they, they consider the tools, uh, the meeting tools and so on, last year to be insufficient uh, for their needs. Now, of course, with the rest of the world beta tested uh, such mm -hmm. tools for, for, for the last year, when we finally roll it out in May, we see really good adoption. And the uh, uh, educators, as well as the pharmacists and clinics and so on, took just, I think, two or three weeks uh, to adopt uh, this new way of working together. But nowadays, of course, we're back to zero COVID cases. Yeah. Uh, so many of the educational and medical institutions are now rolling back uh, some of their uh, measures. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's natural uh, for them to do that, and we need to, uh, I told the National Healthcare um, Insurance Administration to focus on the things uh, that are actually providing a value for the clinicians themselves uh, when done uh, in a telemedicine situation. For example, in the rural areas, in the indigenous nations, in the offshore islands, uh, as well as in the places where there's plenty of 5G uh, coverage yeah. in their community, but not in a fiber optic connection, and things like that, and spend uh, money on these places uh, where it actually provides an, uh, not a nice to have but a must have and then uh, when we get the platform easy to use enough and convenient enough then we'll go back and talk to the um, hospital information systems in the hospital that are considering this at this moment nice to have thank you so much thank you and perhaps along the same line of healthcare mm -hmm. we chatted earlier data yes yeah, in Taiwan mm -hmm. very rich very resourceful populations comprised of multi-ethnicities. Yes. What's the government thinking on? Is it just concerned that, it, I mean, it's not going to disclose individual data perhaps, mm -hmm. but what's the government's mm -hmm. thinking on that? Yeah, um, so um, part of our <coughs> national action plan on open government is to maximize uh, the value of data. And, and those ideas of high value data sets uh, is actually, I think, a European idea <laughs> that we just ad ad adopted. Uh, but uh, I think one of the main uh, um, difference uh, is that although our Privacy uh, Protection, Personal Data Protection Act was largely modeled on the EU one before GDPR, uh, we have not made the kind of GDPR assumption uh, that there is a fundamental trade-off between privacy on one side and uh, usability uh, on the other. Uh, GDPR made that assumption because it was at an age, at an era, uh, like before the zero-knowledge proofs on blockchains and, and many other mathematical inventions like 
homomorphic encryption uh, was commercially available. So on, on that particular year, it's probably true that there was such a trade-off. But recently, uh, if you check out my, my Instagram at Digital Minister, I, I partner with the National Center for High-Speed Computation uh, to roll out a set of uh, popular memes, videos like the bubble tea, uh, and, and it pictures me uh, kind of wearing a blindfold and operating on your health data without looking at it. Uh, anyway, it's supposed to, to be a, a light-hearted introduction uh, to the very difficult mathematical idea of homomorphic encryption. I don't know the math either, actually. So, but, but the idea is very simple. If I trust the National Health Care Insurance, the NHI, the NHI trusts a cloud provider like the NCHC. Trust is not transitive, right? So if they hand out my personal data to NCHC for computation, it means that I trust them less because I don't trust this third party. Uh, and in GDPR terms, uh, it, it could uh, it be only a kind of uh, trade-off decision in this particular configuration. But with homomorphic encryption, uh, it is soft. Basically, the NHI can encrypt my data and send it to the NCHC, which does all the computation it wants, but operating on encrypted data. So it knows nothing about what that contains. Uh, and then after it does the computation, it sends back the result which we then decrypt and get the results back. So it decouples uh, data access storage with data computation. And there's many new inventions like these uh, that uh, we're now working uh, actively with the NCHC uh, on. And so I believe um, it's just like sustainability and development. So when I was a child, these two words represent a trade-off, right? <laughs> you, you either care more about environment or about economic development. But now it's, it's the same idea, sustainable development and that's because we've um, innovated on new forms of energy, new forms of circular economy, and so on, uh, that can actually advance the development part without sacrificing the sustainability part and vice versa. So I'm, I'm really um, happy that we got this experimentation uh, lab kind of uh, with the latest uh, privacy-enhancing technologies, and we're also happy uh, to share with the, the European counterparts now that they're also considering uh, where does GDPR go. Uh, after these new ideas that comes from the blockchain communities. Um, there is uh, time for a uh, last question, because the uh, Minister Tang is, so we have time for two questions then. <laughs> so, <laughs> one is from Mauer. Hi, uh, Minister Tang. I'm a co-chair of the HR committee, and uh, I want to raise a question regarding the employment issue. We understand that during the past two years, uh, due to COVID-19, the uh, hybrid work and working from home has become the new model. And I understand that you are also you also uh, work from home most of the time. So I just wonder whether uh, I just want to seek your insight regarding what's your views regarding the future work model. And you know, uh, for example, because um, currently even though most of the people have to return to the office, but there are still some people who work from home. And when you are work from home, um, most of people think it's uh, meaningless to keep the so-called attendance record. And I just wonder what are your view in this regard, and what what will you view regarding whether our legal system should uh, uh, whether the uh, the legal system should be updated to embrace the new work model? Yeah. Back in 2015, uh, when I uh, helped Minister Jacqueline Tsai launch the first e rulemaking project in, in V-Taiwan, uh, we worked on the teleworking regulations with the Ministry of Labor. Uh, and so the Chu Qin Ji Ru and the Zai Hai Gong Shang Ren Ding or whatever, <coughs> all these basic labor law kind of conceptual bridges to a teleworking environment uh, has already been done. So uh, I think we're on firm uh, regulation and legal ground here. Now, uh, of course, the norm is another matter altogether. The, the fact that we have such regulations doesn't mean that the companies consider it normal uh, to adopt teleworking. So yes, I'm a teleworking minister. When I announced publicly that I'm only uh, entering the cabinet building on Mondays and Thursdays uh, when I entered the cabinet in 2016, uh, I, I think some major media did a poll. And I think only around 60% of people feel comfortable with this. So I'm on kind of thin democratic ground here. Uh, and, and 
then uh, I think the same media ask, so what if any level of public servants could do this? And I think the support level was just 30, 40 percent or something. It's on even thinner <laughs> democratic grounds. Uh, so obviously the norm is not the same as the teleworking regulation we passed uh, in 2015. Now fast forward to today, of course, I think most people consider that teleworking is a necessity now, uh, but it's a skill that all must have. Uh, I think we have this norm here. But uh, whether to spend all the time in the teleworking um, community, I think that depends on the nature of the work. Uh, I, I spent two days uh, a week in the cabinet office, not because I have to, but I consider that this is the kind of minimal amount required for me to build camaraderie and solidarity uh, with my teammates. Uh, and in the other days, I'm not at home, uh, strictly speaking. Uh, I'm, I'm touring around Taiwan or, or touring around the world before the pandemic, uh, as it were. Uh, but I can work from from, from anywhere. The Taiwan High Speed Rails actually is one of my favorite home offices. <laughs> right? I, I could travel anywhere and I do uh, like uh, interviews and so on uh, on the uh, high speed rails thanks to the amazing 5G and 4G infrastructure uh, along the lines and the amazing noise cancelling uh, machine learning algorithms <laughs> that allows me to, to block all the uh, beeps and what <laughs> that is part of the high speed rails. Um, and so at least the sound quality would be really good. The video sometimes lags. But anyway, the, the point here is that uh, if, if you're comfortable in a team with this part-time teleworking, I, I think that is the hybrid solution that most people are most happy uh, with. And I don't really advocate for 100% teleworking. Uh, when I work with Silicon Valley companies like Social Techs and Apple and so on, it's true that I don't live in Palo Alto or Cupertino and so on. But uh, in Palo Alto, for example, every half a year, we have a or hands meeting. Uh, and then my colleagues even sent me, uh, FedEx me, uh, kind of boxes of Napa Valley wine. Uh, not very expensive, not expensive at all, actually, uh, but just so that we can maintain kind of the same uh, camaraderie atmosphere, right, before we get to work or after we go to work, we can drink and know the taste that the other party drinks from, uh, you know, the other side of the world tastes the same or when they uh, usually hang out after work to, to the local Gordon Biersch. And when the GB opens in, in Taiwan as GB Xian now. They insisted that I go there and telework <laughs> so that we can enjoy the same atmosphere and so on. So, so this, this non-verbal, this convivial uh, parts must be intentionally designed when you telework. But you can't design that unless you have at least spent some quality time together. By the way, the GB is a management <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Thomas. I'm working with Gandhi, a domain name registrar, right, which you know. Um, I didn't know that you like wine, actually, and uh, there's, a, there's a European Christmas market just next to here, like maybe 10 minutes walk at Shangti Avenue until, until Sunday. It's also supported by the European Chamber, so there's, a, there's an event there which is promoting European foods and European uh, uh, drinks as well, because Europe is very good for food, right? You've been living there, so you know very well. Um, my question now is, um, uh, there's, a, there's a growing digital divide for people who are foreigners in Taiwan, and it's the same in every country. What I mean with that is uh, if you have a foreign ID number, for example, or if you, have a, if, you, if you cannot use the website in Chinese, then you click on the English button and it just brings you to the company portal and says like, hey, okay, uh, this is our corporate information and there's no information at all. But even if you use Chinese, um, I have this problematic and many of my friends as well. I even have some friends who are entrepreneurs who applied for Taiwanese citizenship because they are fed up living in Taiwan since 30 years and they cannot access oh, yeah, the naturalize services. everyone. That's yeah, one solution. Yes. Yeah. The solution is to naturalize, of course. But, uh, but uh, you know, for, for example, I have some entrepreneur friends who want to start a business. They say they could get a small loan in Taiwan, which is very good rates in Taiwan, like 3% for maybe pay them off in 10 years. Uh, but they cannot apply it because everyone asks them to go on the website. Um, enter their ID number and it's incompatible and it just it, that's already where they are blocked. And uh, even myself, I ask my bank if I can invest, invest in some structures, ETF, I have a very good relationship with them, I know they are VPs and whatever. They say, oh, you can do it, we're good for you. Then they set up everything and finally say, oh, we cannot, but you can do it over the counter. You know, so <laughs> you can come in person every time you want to buy and sell something. So uh, I don't want to do this. So my question is, what kind of solution you can see for, for, for giving more access to people who are foreign residents? Like I think there's even 700,000 migrant workers in Taiwan, right? So that's a, for, for businesses actually a very good population, but no matter who I talk with, the, even with the private sector, they don't really see the solutions because the system is always adapted towards uh, residents, right? So, yeah. But do you think there could be a law or 
or some uh, legislation to actually force at least some specific sectors to be more inclusive for people to avoid digital divide? Well, first of all, for the record, as a public servant since 2016, I don't drink alcoholic drinks anymore. <laughs> okay, for the record. <laughs> right. um, and, and so uh, now to your question. Um, I think for the public service, uh, the, the reason why for vaccination and many other like mask and whatever systems, we've switched from using uh, the uh, kind of citizen digital certificate, which really has a really slow rollout to the National Health Card, is also because the National Health Care protects residents, uh, not just citizens. Uh, and, and because the, it's like a social security number, right? So if you don't think that this number uh, is secure anymore, you can always get a new number on the National Health Insurance. So the National Health Insurance system is already having this idea of continuity across many numbers. Uh, and so for, for the National Health uh, Insurance Agency, uh, really as a foreigner or not a foreign, it doesn't really matter, right? So, so uh, it cares only about a kind of unified ID that's printed on the NHS. I caught. So if you have not updated to the new style uh, foreign uh, resident certificate ID, it, it's okay. The NHI doesn't really care. And if you change, the NHI has a sense of continuity. Now, I think it's even solved the uh, mobile identification issue. So if you uh, have a monthly plan, you can actually also use the NHI Express app and authenticate yourself to, to it. So the NHI Express app, I think, is equal. Uh, it, it provides equity uh, to people with uh, the, the foreign and style ID cards. So it, it, especially in the public sector, uh, we're seeing more and more like Ministry of Labor and so on, uh, certainly for tax filing and so on, switching to the national health care or the mobile ID as the two primary uh, identifying numbers. Uh, and uh, I think the, the uh, expert community, the foreigner community, made a push last year uh, to the tax agency when they did not update the TWID. So the new style tax filing service using mobile ID was uh, citizen only. But that says a lot about the, our expectation. Like e if you use the national health care ID, you must also cover for resident, otherwise it is your problem, right? So I think this norm setting is good and we should still uh, look into more parts of public service that doesn't accept either the NHI based authentication or mobile ID based authentication because the foreigner community is equal in these two main modes of authentication. Uh, and as for the, the, you know, the, the numbering of the national ID card and things like that, unless we naturalize any, everyone, it's difficult to get an incentive for everyone to up upgrade their systems based on the kind of physical ID card. I think the, the next push may, may come when uh, we, we introduce the, the kind of second digit, a new second digit uh, for domestic persons. Uh, that may come um, in a year or two, uh, and that will be another window to push uh, for more wide recognition uh, for the uh, digits uh, eight and nine, right? So uh, that, that, that day will come, but before that day comes, I think we should push for mobile ID and or NHI Express for the private sector and the public sector respectively. Thank you, thank you, Minister Tan. Uh, we just have a small token of appreciation. Uh, a cup of uh, coffee here, okay? Or a, a cup without coffee. Thank you. 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 Thank you.